Hello, this is Dr. Dan, Dan Guerra coming to you from Authentic Biochemistry Studios in the Inland Pacific Northwest. I'm going to talk to you today about our new discussion parameters and our new axis, which is going to include um, a fair amount of in-depth discussion of cancer. So I've already initiated this in the first couple of uh, video and um, authentic biochemistry audio podcasts. But right now I want to get at um, some really nitty gritty about a couple of proteins and metabolic pathways that are particularly interesting when we look at certain cancers. And this is all going to fold together into the larger parameter, which is all just about bioenergetics and metabolism. So that's why I titled this talk, uh, Bioenergetics and Metabolism, Biomedical Series, Cancer. I'm going to talk about a protease inhibitor, GTPases to some degree, and of course, my metabolic pathway, which I, amazingly, it's not what I really chose, but for no other reason than I do lipid biochemistry. So I'm going to study lipogenesis here in this discussion. Today is the 9th of June, 2020. And I'm Dr. Dan Guerra. You can see me there in that picture. And you can see I look just like that uh, in real life. So let's get started. All right. So this diagram here comes from Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society 2018. Here's my reference down there. And this is talking about different ways that cell debris, dead cells, or even living cells, can enter into um, a tissue bed. So this is called the movement of proteins and cell debris through something called macropenocytosis. You can get whole dead cells from, let's say, the serum, or you can get dying cells, um, or you can get live cells if they're small enough, if they fit into the correct endocytic pathway. So when you take in cell debris, which includes, of course, just organic compounds, pieces of membrane, uh, such as bacterial fragments, which could induce an immune response, um, amino acids, whole proteins, lipids, lipoproteins, carbohydrates, carbohydrates bound to other serum components, serum albumin bound to fatty acid, this sort of molecular event coming into the cell. It's going to have one way of going through, and we call that macropenocytosis. Uh, and so the second thing or, um, is going to be called uh, phagocytosis, Phagocytosis has to do with taking up dead cells and then being digested eventually within the cell. And that digestion will then release, hopefully, organic compounds that could be used by that cell. And then finally, whole live cells. That's a process called entosis. Okay? So the scavenged substrates are contained within large vesicles. You can see these vesicles starting to form here. And they could be a macropenosome, a phagosome, or an entotic vacuole, okay? And it's gonna basically be a lysosome associated with a with one of these endosomes. And that's how you're gonna form this um, complex structure that's going to be in constant dynamic flux because of a couple of proteins, this PIC5 and the mTORC. And those are gonna regulate the intake of cellular debris, dead cells or live cells into a given cell. And they're going to allow for them to be digested, but it's going to be a blockage of anything that's internal for autophagy because of the mTORC activity, which is basically going to generate a kinase cascade. So at the same time, it's blocking endogenous aut autophagy. It's going to allow for the degradation of these extracellular components via macropenocytosis, megacytosis, or entosis, because it's going to make these systems it's going to have a lysosomal network. It's going to be in constant dynamic with this larger system. Ultimately, you're going to get a breakdown because of proteases, lipases, and glucosidases, uh, eventually to low molecular mass organic compounds that can be reutilized for protein synthesis, for bioenergetics, and for something called anaplerosis. Anaplerosis just means filling up. It's from the Greek and that's what we think about when we talk uh, about the TCA cycle. So the TCA cycle has several places where intermediates in the pathway can enter and thus enhance the flux through that pathway. 
depending where they enter, they can either be involved in NADH or FADH production, or they can be involved in dealing with other metabolic needs, such as the urea cycle. And when you think about something like fumarate or transamination reactions, when you're thinking about amino acid utilization or, or fatty acid synthesis, when you're thinking about citric acid leaving the mitochondria. So that's what the anaplerosis aspect of it is. So just to finish off this first slide, degraded substrates and metabolites are redistributed into the lysosomal network. B, I told you the PIC5 and the mTORC1. Uh, there's a fission reaction that will occur ultimately. And the PIC5 also controls the utilization of scavenged amino acids because of proteolytic degradation of proteins. And those can be reused, as I said, for protein synthesis. So following the refusion of the cytos of the system of the lysosomes with the autophagolysosomes, mTORC facilitates the fission of the lysosomal membrane again, recycling those uh, lysosomal network processes so that you can make this uh, membrane fusion and then fission and then carry on this degradation pathway, utilizing those intermediates then for uh, metabolism. Okay, so that's called the autophagic lysosomal reformation. And that's, that, that's ALR, it's, it's something you study in um, subcellular physiology. Now, here's our first papers published in Frontiers of Oncology, uh, 2019. And you can see the citation there. So there's a mutant protein called CRAS, which is basically an intracellular GTPase. It stimulates macropenocytosis, that process I just showed you, and autophagy that can scavenge nutrients from respectively external, and then of course autophagy directly would be internal compartments. And thus that can sustain cancer cells or tumor cells. Now both nutrient scavenging pathways will generate those macropenosomes and those autophagosomes respectively, we just saw, that later fuse with the lysosomal system, which has all the enzymes for degradation. Those engage with lipolytic, proteolytic, and nucleolytic as also a glucosidic degradation, thus providing the remodeled cell, that's what's happening, you're remodeling the cell biochemically uh, with the bioenergetic substrates like L amino acids, fatty acids, glycerol, and glucose. So one of the major uses of this system, of course, is just for bioenergetics, for energy production. Same monomers I just mentioned there can be diverted to rebuild enzymes, of course, which is peptide bonds formed from the amino acids, uh, after a translational process with ribosomes, either cytosolic, of course, or with the ER. Transcription factors, of course, membrane and signaling lipids, and any essential intermediates, that's the anaplerotic system that will eventually drive anabolism, which is an mTORC-mediated pathway. And that, again, is going to drive a means to a specific cellular end. Now, crass mutations, okay, remember I just told you that this GTPase is involved in this process. Mutations in CRAS are associated with lung and pancreatic cancers. And they can induce the lysosomal compartment because of an increased activity of a couple of transcription factors called TFAB and TFA3. Those promote lysosomal biogenesis. Those would be two references you would get out of this paper if I took you to them. In, and then you can go to that paper if you want to find out what those are. Now, in CRAS-driven murine non-small cell lung carcinoma, glucose starvation activates the AMP kinase. We've talked about the AMP kinase before. That promotes dephosphorylation and nuclear translocation of that TFAB and TFA3, promoting lung tumors with an increased lysosomal gene transcription signature. This has been observed in progressive disease recurrence in human lung adenocarcinoma patients. While upregulation and increased nuclear residence of the TFA3 sustains pancreatic tumor growth. So you see how these same proteins are involved in multiple kinds of tumors. Overexpression of another protein called MITF, belonging to this family of transcription factors we've been just describing here, like the TFAB and TFA3, promotes a progression of KRAS or CRAS mutant pan-in lesions. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. It's a pancreatic process. Uh, and those lesions will then lead to PDEC, that's pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. That's the kind that will kill you. 
indicating that increased lysosomal activity could be a driver function utilizing this mutant KRAS or CRAS in tumors, particularly in this case, the pancreatic tumor system. So this is a paper now published in Frontiers of Physiology in uh, 2016. This is showing you anchorage-dependent metastasis. Okay, this is coming from a fully blown cancer-ridden system. Here's your extracellular matrix out here with these various ATP and albumin-bound fatty acids. Um, you also have a whole series of other proteins that may be associated with this process. You internalize, this is again this penocytosis, this macropenocytosis process, nutrients, even exosomes, therapeutics like drugs, death receptors, that's whole proteins, macropenocytic receptors themselves, transcription activators like ERB3, a lot of things are out there in the extracellular matrix. And they're going to then make it into the cytosol of the cell. Now, at the same time, you're getting this process of uh, metastasis because you're getting the cell to be able to start growing out because of the cytoskeleton actin filament formation. So this is going on as well. This is how cells start to bleb off or metastasize from initial tumors and then cause a rampant carcinogenesis in the entire tissue battery, even if it gets into the blood throughout the body. So this is a process I'm showing you, basically a published publication showing you how you recycle this system. Not only are you getting bioenergetic nutrients, you're also getting this lysosomal degradation process. You're getting some proteins you took in, um, maybe at the same time they bound to ligand from this macropenocytosis system you pull them into this macro penicidic endosome, and then it can trigger a response in the nucleus. So you're getting transcription factors now being translocated from the plasma membrane after being activated by something in the extracellular matrix. So not only are you getting these nutrients in macropenocytosis, for example, or in entosis, uh, or in phagocytosis, you're also getting a signaling process all the way at the level of transcriptional activation. And this can include all kinds of different processes, death, death receptors. Uh, you can get, again, a transcription of a whole new pathway because of a receptor complex, makes it through this endosomal processing, and then errantly or inappropriately gets into the nucleus. It starts firing away new transcription paradigms. Those new transcription paradigms can turn this cell into a tumor cell real quickly, right? Uh, or it can cause the cell to signal, perhaps producing a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, especially if it's like an immune cell, like say a T lymphocyte. So there's a lot of different things that can go on once you allow for this macropenocytosis process to turn on the pathway. So that's the point I wanted to make. Bioenergetics and now an alteration of the signature of transcription of the cell. Yeah. So there is therefore what I call a molecular interlocution between autophagy and endocytosis, and that involves what's called non-canonical autophagy. Canonical autophagy is just where the cell rearranges its macromolecular structure, tears down cytoskeletal proteins, enzymes, membrane lipids, uh, maybe complex carbohydrates or carbohydrate bound to other organic molecules like lipids or proteins and then runs all those monomeric forms back through for ATP production, for example, ultimately via, of course, the relaxation of NADH and FADH2, or maybe for rebuilding proteins like we saw in that first slide. Okay? So that's more of a canonical autophagy. This non-canonical autophagy has to do with this taking things from outside and then completely retailoring or reprogramming or remodeling what the cell is up to. And it does not depend on the formation of a double membrane autophagosome or fat autophagolysosome. So in order to involve the degradation of any intracellular cargo, okay, it's all extracellular. So dur again, during classical autophagy or autophagy, two ubiquitin-like conjugation systems direct the lipidation of a cytosolic protein called HG8. Uh, for example, one of those kind of proteins has a signature LC3. And that's onto the lipid phosphatidylethanolamine, or PE, on membranes. And then that triggers the autophagolysosomal system to commence. During the non-canonical autophagy, 
those conjugated systems instead target LC3 lipidation onto endocytic membranes, the process we've been talking about now, and that includes these macropenosomes. Okay. That's pulling things out of the matrix, out of the serum. So macropenocytosis is a non-selective, actin-dependent, actin actin members causing that pinching of the membrane, allowing for that infusion of those endosomes, right? Um, that results in the inclusion of extracellular serum-based serial debris, proteins and lipids packed into those vesicles we saw. Process not only provides a scavenger mechanism for free supply of a chain, nutrition, but also likely attenuates and even transforms the immune response because it can, uh, it can surprise and elude the immune response. Uh, and bloodborne signaling otherwise launched to attack the growing tumor. So it can, in other words, there might be processes going on in the serum that are ready to destroy a tumor, but the engulfing and the macropenocytosis of those signaling molecules can render that armamentarium neutralized. Yeah. So amino acids are important products course, of the autophagic recycling in mammals, where the autophagy or autophagy deficiency in response to starvation after birth is associated with decreased tissue and plasma amino acid levels in adulthood with decreased levels of plasma arginine. It's a well-known process. Starved autophagy deficient adult mice, for example, die as a result of acute hypoglycemia and the fact potentially linked to a lack of amino acid recycling to support gluconeogenesis in the liver, okay? That's where the carbon comes from. Macropenocytic scavenging is therefore targeted toward amino acids because amino acids, are, many of them are essential, almost half of them are, right? Albumin is one key scavenge protein, so that's the source of the amino acids. Of course, it's gonna also be full of fatty acid, right? Because fatty acids translocate in the serum non-selectively via serum albumin. So it's shown to rescue cancer cells from amino acid starvation because it's pulling in that protein albumin and contributes to the free amino acid pool that can ultimately be utilized in the pancreatic tumors, for example, to build up glucose synthesis. Non-cancer cells, such as macrophages, can also contribute to mi micropenocytosis or macropenocytosis, either one, suggesting that scavenging activity could more generally contribute to provide amino acids to cancer tissues via even those innate immune cells, the macrophages. In addition to amino acids, other key metabolites such as ions, right? Uh, potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, manganese, for example, chloride, lipids, I just told you fatty acids, sometimes maybe even entire string of lipids, nucleosides, right? Uh, are recycled or scavenged to support the survival or growth of the starved cells. Nucleosides have emerged as a key recycle substrate that supports the survival of those star cells. Okay. Lysosomal degradation of ribosomal RNA also generates nucleosides, of course, because that's RNA, that are exported and used as energy generating substrates to support cell survival or nucleic acid synthesis. So, you know, you can break down nucleotides and nucleosides into things like malonyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA and propionyl-CoA. Uh, ultimately, you can be recycled all the way through the TCA cycle via anaplerosis, via transamination reactions, or via gutting around the carboxylic acid chain, uh, removing uh, side chains, etc., ultimately yielding carbon for gluconeogenesis. So nucleosides can be used for that, or they can be used to resynthesize nucleic acids, such as said, particularly RNA. But after... Um, the ribonucleotide reductase, you can also make DNA, of course. This is also a way that invading microorganisms like bacteria and viruses can get more uh, nucleotides for the production of their RNA or for replication of their DNA. So you get promo promotion of survival of RAS mutant lung cancer cells in response to starvation because you get this process kicked in. Tumor opportunistic macropenocytosis provides therefore for high caloric and essential nutrient requirements or needs. Plus it gets all the transcriptional, translational, metabolic flexibility I've just been talking about. Indeed, KRAS or CRAS mutations stimulate, I just told you, it's the GTPAs, macropenocytosis, mediated albumin apprehension, thus ultimately increasing the intracellular pool of amino acids 
including glutamine, which is really a good amino acid for the GCA cycle, serves as a carbon bioenergetic source in that way, in that capacity, plus a steady substrate for pyrimidine nucleotide production. It's good to utilize there. KRAS mutant pancreatic cancer cells. Glutamine is the major carbon source consumed via that non-canonical autophagic pathway. All right, so again, this is showing you that system. You're bringing in these nutrients via macropenocytosis. You're getting amino acids produced. You're getting some of this cellular debris being controlled through this autophagy process. Uh, KRAS is regulating that. KRAS also generates this G12D, which is going to block GLUD1. Now, what is GLUD1 or GLUD1? Besides having a really ugly acronym, it encodes for glutamine dehydro glutamate dehydrogenase. That's the mitochondrial masic enzyme that catalyzes the oxidative, oxidative deamination of glutamate to alpha KG and ammonia. So the ammonia has to be kicked up in the urea cycle, of course, which can be accommodated here, no problem. But the carbon alpha ketoglutarate glutarate can go right into the TCA cycle, which is shown here, right? So if, if you, that's what GLUT1 normally does. It allows you to make alpha KG. But glutamine, you see, if it's kicked off from this amino acid pool and enters into the mitochondria, you get the GLS enzyme, right? And that's going to give you glutamate. The glutamate can still make alpha KG. And alpha KG, because of transamination reactions with glutamate and alpha KG uh, in association with uh, oxalacetic acid and aspartate, is going to run that transamination ring. Right? Aspartate can then leave the, the system and go into the cytoplasm where it can be converted to OAA and then be a cytosolic malate dehydrogenase malate and then malate to pyruvate via the malic enzyme. And there you're making NADPH, which is utilized for reductive biosynthesis. The same time at the transcriptional level, you're getting increases in lysosomal genes, increases in antioxidant genes, you're also getting all these amino acid transporters set up, and you're getting the glutamine consumption enzymes, which are all involved in this process in the mitochondria. So you get the idea of what's going on here now. This is more intermediary metabolism. So you have bioenergetics, you have transcriptional translational control via this macropenocytosis. Now I'm showing you more of the anaplerosis end of it. I'm showing you how the TCA cycle can be utilized to make a lot of NADPH, for example, and can also make intermediates in this pathway that ultimately could be used for any number of metabolic needs. And KRAS mutant can form this bridge of bringing in these nutrients and generating a cycle for the tumor, right, which is ultimately going to feed that tumor. All right. So KRAS mutant pancreatic cancer cells, glutamine is the major carbon source that's consumed via that non economic canonical pathway I just showed you through glutamate and then the transam to aspartate and the NADPH production. And the majority of the non-transformed cells in mitochondria, glutamine-derived glutamate is converted by the enzyme GLUT1. We just showed you that in an alpha glutarate to fuel the TCA cycle, right? So that's how that process normally works. However, in PDAC cells, remember that is the... Uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Glutamine is used by the mitochondrial aspartate transaminase, GOT2, I just showed you that, to produce aspartate and alpha-KG. Aspartate transported to the cytoplasm, where it is converted to OAA by the aspartate transaminase reaction, and then into malate and pyruvate. That's going to elevate the NADPH and NDP levels for reductive biosynthesis. That's going to sustain the cell redox potential, and it's going to make it so that you can synthesize complex molecules like nucleic acids and lipids, which require reductive biosynthesis in the form of NADPH is producing, or as is generating that reducing power. KRAS therefore drives the alternative glutamine consumption pathway, which I just showed you, by operating a transcription of GOT1 and reducing the expression of the GLUT1. That's the way it works. Okay? So it controls the chromatin, chromatin remodeling level. While the pathway is essential for PDAC, it is uncommon in healthy cells. So it could be a potential target uh, for pharmaceutical companies. In fact, definitely been looked at. Now, monounsaturated fatty acids are taken up by a RAS mutant cancer cell line directly from the serum. Okay? 
And this, this is a process we can talk, call lipophagy, which I'll get into in a moment here. It could enter cells through macropenocytosis. Fatty acids can also enter cells through ma- macropenocytosis by binding to serum albumin. I told you that a couple of slides ago. Already in the serum, so you get amino acids from the protein. You get fatty acids bound to it. So lipophagy may be upregulated in starved cells to promote mitochondrial metabolism through, of course, beta oxidation of those fatty acids, thus altering glucose import, right? Because now you're making, not now you're burning fatty acids, you're making NADH and FADH that way rather than via glycolysis and TCA cycle. Potentially diminishes metastasis because of the heavy ATP load requiring to carry out cell division growth and both detachment and invasion. So lipophagy, sometimes, depending on the certain stage of the cancer, can actually promote um, those, uh, a, a process wherein the cancer cells slow down their division rate, slow down their growth rate, and can't metastasize. Okay. So you see here, you get an engulfment of these lipid droplets via this protein called ATG12516. Okay, and then using that LC32 protein around the lipid droplet in a production of what's called a phagophore, just like the phagosome or the autophagolysosome we saw with proteins. So you get an autophagosome then from this lipid droplet generating some lipid inside there. You get an autolysosome, same thing, these fatty acids are being cleaved off, right? You get hydrolytic enzymes like lipases donated by the lysosome. This is where you can get lipids that are right there in the cell, utilizing this engulfment pathway, right? this autophagic process, taking the lipid droplet, breaking it on the triacylglycerol after the removal of the perilipins, which are what these proteins are, around the oil droplet, okay, which are on that unit membrane around the oil droplet. You're getting now lipase activity, fatty acids, beta oxidation, ATP. The lipid droplet lipolysis through a CMA-dependent degradation of plins also is functional here. These plins, again, are these perilipins, which surround the oil droplet. So you get direct lipophagy this way, and this can direct via, by, by pirating these hydrolytic or, or uh, lipase enzymes, the fatty acid uh, accumulation, and therefore running it through the beta oxidation for ATP directly from the lipid droplet without using the endolysosomal process. So either way, you can get lipogenesis. Now, this is a slower process. It does produce a lot of ATP, but because it's slower, it can slow down the metastasis. And if it slows down metastasis, other drugs can come in and blockade that cell division process, and therefore the tumor can be ablated. So you see, tumors have a complex life cycle. Sometimes they use carbohydrate in the form of glucose for their energy source. Sometimes they use fatty acids different parts of the tumor, depending on whether or not they're hypoxic. If they're hypoxic, they obviously can't do fatty acid beta oxidation because it requires molecular oxygen. They also can't do electron transport chain uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So they, they end up being reliant on glycolysis. And remember, that's what we call rampant glycolysis. This is all part of that pathway that you see in many tumors, right? And so that process also can take over where you're just burning glucose, right? So both of these kinds of affinities for this carbon source can be assimilated depending on the temporality of the tumor and what stage it's in. So the role of KRAS in detoxification is also reported in advanced lung cancer where an enrichment in mutant alleles of that gene promote channeling of glucose-derived metabolites into the TCA, and for glutathione biosynthesis. Glutathione is really important when controlling tumorigenesis because it can remove reactive oxygen. Right? So that inhibits, that inhibits, enhances, excuse me, the management of those ROS and increases the metastatic potential. My, macroautophagy, here referred to as just plain old autophagy, promotes survival under metabolic stress conditions by directing intracellular components to lysosomes, which you saw with li- the lipophagy, via the formation of vesicles known as autophagosomes. Autophagy therefore supports cell survival, that could also be a tumor cell, right? Under stress conditions, okay. Allowing tumor persistence is known to sustain several aspects of RAS transformation in cancers that use RAS. 
from the maintenance of the cell glycolytic capacity of the mitochondrial oxidative metabolism, which it keeps open. Autophagy can be both pro and anti tumorigenic, therefore, what I've been trying to prescribe to you. But increasing evidence in the mouse model of pancreatic cancer, PDEC models, indicates that especially at later stages of tumorigenesis, autophagy does indeed sustain tumor growth. Indeed, pancreatic deletion of the autophagy gene, HG5, in a model of pancreatic cancer driven by the oncogenic KRAS and the stochastic loss of heterozygosity of something called TRIP53. So we're going to call that line KRAS. This is a mutation, G to 12D, right? And then there's going to be a TRIP53 LOX system, so you can turn off that TRIP53 system by using the LOX P CRE system, which is a recombinase, site specific recombinase. It's a condition that reproduces the stepwise human development of PDAC, increases the number of pan, uh, pan in lesions, but impairs the progression of pan into PDAC prolonging mouse survival. So you see, even though you're getting this process, you can pirate it and subjugate it and slow metastasis. Okay? That's the important key factor here. So in the process of going from an inflammatory, from pancreatitis, for example, example, or steatosis in the pancreas, fat buildup, you can get to a point where you can continue that process, maintain it, therefore make it stay at a steady state and not enhance the process to go over the edge and get enough energy to become metastatic. That's the issue here. Now, here's a paper published in Annals of Surge Surgery Treatment and Research, 2018 in May, a couple of years ago. PDAC, five-year survival. These are pretty um, negative statistics here. PDAC, five-year survival rate is 5%. And unfortunately, only 10 to 15% of patients are deemed surgically resectable, even at that diagnosis. So prior to PDAC diagnosis, attention is directed to the prodromal phases of the pancreatic lesions. This is where I'm going to give you a full understanding of this um, PAN-IN. So there's a non-invasive, non-metastatic, you see, precursor lesion for pancreatic adenocarcinoma that includes Pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia. That's the pan in, which we we're looking at. Introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, or IPMN. And finally, a mucinous cystic neoplasm, or MCN. Those are the three non invasive precursor lesions that can proceed to PDAC. So, pan in of those three seems to progress towards PDAC where the lesions represent or present, excuse me, a small, generally less than five millimeter size, introductal non-invasive lesion that is formed by proliferation and metaplasia of the ductal epithelia. That's why it's a ductal epithelia. That's, why, that's how this panc pancreatic cancer starts to form. Previous work has suggested a progressively increased pan end frequency and grade from normal pancreas to pancreatitis to pancreatic adenocarcinoma specimens. Right? That's the linear flow of the process. Unfortunately, pan and lesions cannot be accurately identified preoperatively by existing imaging modalities and can only be identified histologically postoperatively in contrast to the other two forms of uh, precursor lesions the IPMNs and the MCNs. So they can be easily detected using radio, radiography and they have been diagnosed indeed preoperatively. Right? So radiology can pick up those other two forms, but not the P, PAN, N. That's what this is saying. So pathologically invasive ductal pancreatic carcinoma present with PAN ends in the pancreatic duct around the invasive carcinoma, around that. Uh, pretumorous lesion, right? So this paper here reviewed data of patients who underwent a pancreatectomy for PDAC, and they looked at patients all the way from 2002 to 2013. So they had 95 patients they looked at. It's not a bad end number for these kinds of surgical uh, examinations, sur surgical research papers. 
So they went underwent a pancreatectomy. Now tumors are mostly commonly located in the pancreas head. Um, uh, and as such, a pancreat, uh, pancreat duodectomy had to be performed, okay? So a different region of the pancreas. So tumors were most commonly located in the pancreas head, and as such, pancreatico duodenectomy was the most commonly performed operation. Okay. So it's a surgical journal, so they're going to tell you what they did. There was no significant difference in overall survival or disease-free survival. There's the important take-home message here. Between the non-PAN-N and the PAN-N groups, therefore, although PAN-N looks like a good place to work from, the presence or absence of PAN-N lesions, at least in this stage where this, where this surgery was performed, did not affect survival in patients undergoing resection for the PDEC. Okay. Now, there's a reason for this, because there's a very subtle difference between temporality of the PDAC progression. This is partially associated with this uh, understanding here. Okay, so it's coming basically from the same paper. Um, normally, you would have T cells uh, in the form of, say, Th1, Th2. You have T reg cells controlling that. You have myeloid derived suppressor cells. You have dendritic cells. You have tumor associated macrophages, which are of the M2 type, those are the quiescent type, or the suppressive type. And you also have just another t regular T cell population. Again, that could be Th2, it could be even Th17. So dendritic cell is going to be blocking the T cell at this stage because it's locked to a T reg cell. So if you have a lot of T reg cell via the CD88 and the matrix histocompatibility complex binding to the T cell receptor and the CTLA4, uh, respectively, that's why you have an immuno. Um, uh, uh, therapy when it comes to pancreatic uh, cancers. That's why you want to block CTLA-4 because it would block this binding. Once that happens, TGF, beta, and IL-10 block the T cell response. That means you're suppressing the immune system. Likewise, this enzyme IDO, which is an endo oxidase, 23 oxy dioxygenase, that is also going to block T cell reactivity. So any endogenous reactivity coming from that tryptophan pathway, TGF beta, any IL-10 like up here, any arginase 1 or any ROS or INOS activity is all going to block this T cell. Now that can come directly from the myeloid derived suppressor cells, killing off the immune response associated with the, the lymphatic system. And that's because the T reg cell again is bound this myeloid derived T cell and that's going to kick off or induce the production of these uh, proteins and these uh, transcription factors and these uh, otherwise uh, activating uh, um, oxygen species or activating enzymes that are going to deactivate the T cell response. Okay. You also have pancreatic stellate cells, which bind through the chemokine receptor directly to the Treg cell, and they are also going to bind via another chemokine receptor to this T cell, shutting down its activity. IDO is going to be coming from the, uh, the, the cancer tumor, the tumor itself. Uh, the tumor is going to also be linked up with a T regulatory cell. This is all immunosuppressive, you see. Pancreatic stellate cell is going to be binding to T reg, going to be binding to this T potentially activating lineage, but it's going to block it off. IDO is going to be generated, that the dioxygenase is going to be generating intermediates from that pathway, the kinurene pathway. I'm going to show you in a moment blocking T cell responses. And then this tumor associated macrophages, they're already totally hooked up with blocking or suppressing the immune response. So macrophage type two, which we talked about previously in other um, authentic biochemistry lectures and also from Vera Med, uh, those are not the macrophages that induce uh, an immune response, those are the ones that suppress it. And see the same, same thing here. We see TGF beta, IL-10, uh, and ARCH1, all that's gonna shut down that T cell normal uh, inflammatory response. And that's all in association with the tumor itself, the PDAC tumor. Okay. So this is the pathway itself. Okay. So I want you to just get an idea what this IDO does. This enzyme, this dioxygenase, um, is involved in the biosynthesis of lots of intermediates. So 
the ones that we're looking at here, of course, you can make uh, serotonin and melatonin via this pathway. But this tryptophanyl tRNA synthetase is also involved in the production of cytotoxic mitochondrial protein synthesis, cytosolic and mitochondrial protein synthesis. So that tryptophan is going to be utilized directly for that. So remember, it has multiple uses, right? Just making for proteins. But if IDO2 or IDO1 or this TDO, these oxygenases, they're going to go through this kinurene pathway, and that's what this is here. So you get N-formal kinurene, right? And then you get kinurene forminidase, making formic acid. And here, whenever you see the red labeled ones, these are all going to be inducing via cancer immunoediting a full-blown PDAC response. So L-kinurene, L-hydroxykinurene, 3-hydroxyanthranilic acid, and then after this diaxinase reaction, making this aminocarboxymuconic semialdehyde, ultimately just uh, degrading to this quinolinic acid, this can also be a really potent inducer of PDAC, as can picolinic acid, going through the aminosuc-muconate uh, uh, semialdehyde against spontaneous reaction, uh, just resolving to this picolinic acid. And of course, if you can take the gluteal CoA and ultimately run it through the TCA cycle and all the way down to carbon dioxide making ATP. But when you build up these intermediates, this is the problem for the progression of what we call cancer immunoediting. So what you have here are three processes, the elimination phase, the equilibrium phase, and ultimately the escape phase. Cool, right? So the initial immunoediting or elimination phase shown here involves sporadically arising transformed cells being destroyed by the innate and adaptive immune systems. That's all really good, okay? Because that's blocking the progression to PDAC, right? You got activated B cells involved here that produce tumor reactive antibodies to eradicate transformed cells. You got natural killer cells out here, which are definitely going to ablate tumor cells. Um, and you have effector T cells like TH1 population to release inflammatory cytokines, such as good old interferon gamma, which activates dendritic cells that secrete low levels of IDO1. Now, when you get IDO1 at the beginning of this system, look at this. It depletes the essential amino acid tryptophan from the tumor microenvironment, and that's going to inhibit tumor growth. So early on, IDO being synthesized from a dendritic cell, you see, this is where this is coming from here, from the dendritic cell, is going to block the tumor cell at the elimination phase. Eliminating what? The tumor formation. Eliminating what? Cancer completely. It's a complete elimination at this early phase. Now, you can move to the equilibrium phase, right? This isn't where the NK cells, the dendritic cells are functioning anymore. This is where you get an accumulation of mutations. For example, KRAS, or uh, as we'll see, other, other transcription factors or signaling molecules. Um, you're going to get the tumor still under some control, from the innate and the acquired immune system. And you're going to get a selection for immune evasion because you're going to be adding those mutations. So whatever survives is going to be mutated and be able to go to the final or escape phase. Tumor survival, full-blown, immunosuppression, like we just saw on the last slide, and then, of course, a stage of immune tolerance. So here's where the tumor cell starts producing this dioxygenase, right, which is going to keep this uh, myeloid cell lineage activating the TAM, and that's going to re resynthesize the IDO, build up this kinurene pathway, and all of that is going to allow for a shutting down of the immune response. So let's go through this, and the words I wrote over here is from a, a, from a paper called, a paper published in Frontiers of Immunology back in 2018, a couple years ago. So the equilibrium phase, I told you, is just kind of like a Tumors accumulate mutations, the tumor becomes clinically manifested, okay, so it escapes. Finally, the escape phase, which is down here, you got high dioxygenase activity produced by the tumor cell, the PDAC cell itself, okay? And you get a tolerogenic immune cell like tolerogenic DCs. These are dendritic cells that are no longer acting to inflame the system and kill the tumor. You get the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Remember, those are the MDSCs and tumor-associated macrophages. Those are the TAMs I just told you about back over here. That leads ultimately in this stage of the process, right, 
immunosuppression and tolerogenicity. And that's inhibiting effector T cells, the TFs like Th1, Th2, Th17, and the natural killer cell functions, right? And stimulates the regulatory T cells, which we already have covered. Uh, so IDO1, that dioxygenase, because it's turning on this kinurene pathway, promotes expansion and activation of these MDSCs, okay? Induces polarization of the macrophages to so the M2 or tolerogenic phenotype. Increased kinurene levels and the other intermediates here in red, like prenolinic acid, picolinic acid, okay? Activate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor or the AHR, okay? That, and that switches the activity of dendritic cells, which otherwise be doing a good job to protect this, this system from a tumor. Uh, switch the activity of dendritic cells from immunogenic to tolerogenic. Elevated CTLA-4, I told you that's usually a target. CTLA-4 uh, monoclonal antibodies are a target. Um, when you want to uh, inhibit that activity and therefore enhance the proliferation of two lymphocytes. Um, expression of regulatory T cells results in further increase in IDO1. Secretion by the dendritic cells, IDO1 induced expansion activation of the regulatory T cell population. You get tolerogenic dendritic cells, you get the MDSCs, and they all suppress the activity of the anti tumor effector T cells. You're gone at this point. And this is why uh, PDAC has a very, very poor outcome, five year survival, as we just saw. There's the IDO gene. There's all of the potential, uh, potential proteins that can bind to the promoter. Right? Any number of promoter, any number of proteins can turn on the IDO gene and facilitate this movement from elimination to equilibrium to escape full cancer, full blown pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So again, here's the kinurene pathway. This comes from a paper published in 2017. Here's the uh, place we can get it online. Again, tryptophan through the first IDO reaction makes kinurene, right? Then there's a CAT2 enzyme or a KMO, a mono, monooxygenase, making an intermediate called HAA, and then this oxidized finally to quinolinic acid. That can actually be used to make niacin when it's working in the good biosynthetic pathway. But what it makes, what it goes through is PDK, which is kinase, GCN2, and that aerial uh, receptor, aerial hydrocarbon receptor. You're going to get immune suppression, tissue healing, vasodilation, and gut homeostasis, okay? all aiding and abetting the tumor. Through the serotonin pathway, you're going to get neuronal signaling, neurotoxicity, pain sensitivity, mood, and depression, also leading directly from this kinurene turning on by that IDO pathway. And that uh, you're going to work the, through the kinurene pathway with the NMDA receptor, the alpha-7, aerial uh, uh, receptor, GPR35, and the PGC1-alpha-1, which is also utilizing fatty acid metabolism. So we're almost there. See a paper published in Gut in 2012. So why do I bring this one up? It's, what, eight years old, right? Almost. Let's go through this because it's going to introduce a new player. Pigment epithelial derived factor, or PEDF, is a non-inhibitory serpent. Now, what serpents are, are serine protease inhibitors. They inhibit serine proteases. Now, that's important because serine proteases can open up the extracellular matrix and allow for metastasis. However, this is a non-inhibitory serpent, so it doesn't function as a protease inhibitor. But it has a moonlighting, potent, anti-angiogenic activity. And therefore, it can be involved in metabolic shifting, in fact, even of adipogenesis, which are both going to be useful for a tumor. So if you knock those down, the tumor will not be able to grow and divide and metastasize. So these two traits are linked to pancreatic cancer and the progression is associated with tumor steatosis, or that is the accumulation of lipid and the inflammatory response associated with that. So PEDF deficiency here in mouse model promotes pancreatic hyperplasia, Okay, excessive growth, and visceral obesity, okay, further enhancing carbon sources and fatty acids. And RAS mutations all turn on by the, because of this. They're common in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, and the P PEDF deficiency seems to be linked to it as precursor product relationship. Right? 
And then important contribution to the research team designate design experiments. Okay, this is an important contribution way back in gut. That's what I'm telling you about it. This team design experiments determine if a loss of PEDF is sufficient to promote adipogenesis and tumor genesis in the pancreas. To affect this, they removed PEDF expression in an LKRAS mutant mouse model, which you know is going to be going toward PDAC, right? Uh, and they're utilizing non-invasive cystic papillary neoplasms to get this thing going, right? Their results demonstrate that LCRAS G12D mutant PEDF deficient by ablating the activity of PDF, PEDF, Developed indeed invasive PDEC associated with enhanced matrix metalloproteinase, allows for metastasis, you see, MMP2 and MMP9, those two isoforms of those metalloproteinases. Expression of both those is transcriptional regulation, therefore. Increased peripancreatic lipid and adipocyte hypertrophy, okay, and intrapancreatic adipocyte infiltration otherwise known as pancreatic steatosis. You see, so that's what happens when you knock down the PEDF and you allow this KRAS mutant to take on this population, right? You get pancreatic steatosis. Now, associated with the lipogenesis you're getting, you're getting pancreatic steatosis, that's lipogenesis. Uh, and the stroma of the pancreas of those L uh, KRAS G12D mutant PEDF deficient mice they had higher levels of two lipid droplet associated proteins. They had the tail interactive protein 47, also known as TIP 47, also known as perilipin 3. Remember, it's a protein associated with that unit membrane around the oil droplet. And another protein called adipose differentiation related protein, or ADRP, uh, or also known as perilipin 2. And tag lipase was also reduced. So that means that you don't get fatty acids being generated outside that oil droplet. PDAC patients present with decreased tissue and serum levels of PEDF, I just told you that, and increased stromal TIP47, so more of that perilipin, keeping that oil droplet intact. Remember that autosomal, autophagosomal process that we were talking about before, right? Lipophagy, right? So serum levels of PDF increased stromal TIP47 expression plus the VEGF to PDF ratios increased. That's all bad. That's all promotive of oncogenesis of PDAC. And this work was determined that PEDF, in a high enough concentration, might limit pancreatic steatosis and perhaps indeed tumor invasion. That was eight years ago. Now, here's a paper published then six years later in the Journal of Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics basically showing you how T2D and obesity, looking at now the T2D islets and the macrophages producing uh, from that, from those islets, okay, producing insulin, glucose, cytokines, and chemokines, taking these um, secretary cells, turning them into pan-ins, remember what those were, right? Those are the ones that were on their way to be steatotic systems. And in the presence of TAMs, remember what those are. Those are those macrophages, which are in the M2 phase, generating growth factor cytokines and chemokines, generating and moving because of the influence of insulin, glucose, glucose cytokines, and chemokines from the pancreas, pancreatic stem cells. That's what those are. Those are stem cells. Generate full-blown PDAC because you get immunosuppression because you're in the M2 phase of the macrophage. Uh, and you're completely utilizing these stem cell populations to go into the pan. And this is why that surgical paper couldn't find that response, because you have to hit this early. This process here also, note, is associated with obesity and type 2 diabetes. So if you have that as a comorbid system, then the pan into PDAC transition is more linear because of this process here, because immune suppression and because of the influence of insulin, glucose, and these cytokines and chemokines coming directly from the pancreatic stem cells or stellate cells. All right, so we're going to leave it at that. Uh, There's a whole new system I want to talk about on protease inhibition and hepatocellular carcinoma, which we're going to get to next time. Okay. So let's end the show here. Um, 
And what I want to tell you is that the reason we went through this whole pathway and ended up with protease inhibitors like serpents, I just showed you the PDEF, which is which has serpent uh, amino acid sequence homology, but it is not function as a serpent. Serpent is nevertheless a protein that is usually at low concentration in pan into PDAC transition, meaning full-blown cancer. And an elevation of that can tank angiogenesis, right? And because of that, it can also potentially block the whole process leading to full-blown ductal carcinoma so that other uh, pharmacotherapeutics can be utilized. For example, once to turn on the lymphocyte brigade, like those knocking out the CTLA-R4 pathway, or of course the death uh, response of the, the whole whole system in terms of death mediated ablation so that the T lymphocytes can be activated, right? Death receptor system. All right, so that's where we were right now. And I also wanna bring up the whole thing about bioenergetics. The fact that when you're lipogenic, it depends on what stage of a cancer and what kind of cancer, non-small cell, lung carcinoma, pancreatic adeno, uh, carcinomas, uh, breast cancers, um, uh, pancreas, all the cancers that we just talked about, pancreatic cancer, as I said, liver cancer, kidney cancer, brain cancer. All of those cancers have different um, transitional states, but they all utilize switching back and forth for bioenergetic needs. Basically, glucose, glutamine is an important amino acid use. You saw that was able to bypass the normal anaplerotic system, generate futile cycles, burning up protein. That's all part of the wasting disease or cachexia of many cancers, okay? Degradation of uh, skeletal proteins from skeletal muscle causing that cachexia. Um, and also our fatty acid metabolism, depending on the level of oxygen, can be used as a good source to deplete those lipid stores that's generating enough ATP to generate an immune response, right? So you have to think about the immune cells, then the tumor cell, and then the resident tissue cells, such as the pancreatic uh, ductal cells. All three of those systems can be affronted differently, but you have to be careful if you inhibit, say, fatty acid synthesis in one of those cell lineages, because you're using some pharmacotherapeutic, you could well be turning on tumor genesis in another system, for example, in the tumor itself, or maybe suppressing the immune response, depending on which um, lymphocytes or leukocytes are being utilized and which phase of the innate or acquired immune response are being triggered during that tumorigenic process, say from the pan, -lin, pan in into the PDAC, full-blown uh, uh, ductal carcinoma in the pancreas, as an example. So hopefully we got this whole process worked out now. What I'm going to do now is go back into protease inhibition for a while. And I'm going to bring up a whole new series of new papers that are going to talk about real serpents, ones that actually have that functionality and how they're related. Okay. So this gives you now a biochemical perspective of the pathophysiology that ends up being the biomedical condition that presents the disease. And again, we're going to start talking more about pharmaceutical drugs, particular immunomodulatory drugs that are going to be used to combat these different types of cancers. So um, what we want to do now is say my normal sign-off, which is um, bye.